<laughs> so just to put it in its context, yeah. we are the reign of um, Sargon the First, Sargon the Great, yes. is uh, at least normally we can't even be sure of we the exact, assume. but we're we're told um, scholars tell us that it's two three three four BC, of course, to two two seven nine BC. So over fifty years. Yeah. That's a good innings. It's such a good innings. That's good innings for now. Right. You start to think, mm, But bit. conversely, right? It's totally we, possible. Well, a, yeah, A, it's plausible. B, there was an Egyptian pharaoh who's said to have reigned for longer. Uh, and C, it's not 28,000 years, mm. right? Right, yeah. <laughs> Which the first Sumerian yeah, king yeah. say. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I'm actually more inclined to believe that that may be something, again, like the exact dates and numbers are always going to be off when you're looking this far back into the murky depths of history. But about 50 years is not Un- unbelievable actually mm. so yeah there's this idea which is totally true that people lived a lot shorter lives in the past certainly in the yeah. in the deep past that's definitely true but it's also true to say that it wasn't unheard of that people would live to be in their 70s 80s or even 90s yes sometimes it was a lot yeah. rarer yeah. but it totally happened Another so th- to have him live into his 70s, say, yeah. and rise to power in his 20s, that's not completely absurd at all. No, no, not at all. And one one thing that uh, people need to remember about um, when we say, well, people used to die a lot younger in the past, that is true, but also a lot of those deaths are very young, uh, and that kind of disproportionately weights the average mortality, the la- average life expectancy of someone living a thousand years ago Mm. um yeah as you said they are completely capable of living into the 70s and 80s and many of them do so Mm. and we have lots of examples of historical figures who have done this Mm. so it's it's really not extreme and i think a lot of it right is actually that a lot of the time they would have had a fairly decent diet i know that sounds like a silly thing but actually what you eat really matters yeah is it Aeschylus? I think Aeschylus lived to be in his 90s, sort of fairly mm. definitely recorded to have been in his 90s. So, again, it was rare, yeah. but it could happen. Also, people, if you made it out of infancy, yeah. you were strong. Yeah. You were physically strong. You probably had a very good immune system in the ancient yeah. world if you made it out of infancy. Yeah. And if you got lucky, you didn't get, you know, uh, any sort of... Uh, yeah, or you didn't like get that. blood poisoning from some yeah. little nick or something. Yeah. Then you could certainly live, yeah, mm. if you didn't get infection from your teeth. Yeah. Just like an animal. I mean, People died from their teeth a lot. Yeah. Just what, like animals well, yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't Socrates like 72 when they put him to death? Right, yeah, he's an old man. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's a, old, old people exist in the ancient world. There's yeah, just right. fewer of them. All right. <laughs> So Sargon of Akkad, to call him, to have the Akkadian Empire, to call him the first emperor, hmm. uh, it seems pretty clear, if you believe the accounts, hmm. if, if you don't say it's just all propaganda, or and it's it could all made all be up, myth. it could be, because <laughs> most of the accounts are from long after he was supposed to have lived. Yeah. Literally um, thousands of years in some cases. But if you believe it, then he did rule over a, a multi-ethnic uh, state. It was, and this is another important point as well. It was an imperial state, as in mm. it had administrators and a bureaucracy and regional governors who resided over cities and provinces and who answered directly to Sargon. So it definitely had an imperial structure. Yeah, it seems to have done, absolutely. Mm. So I, it's kind of fair. I think it's totally fair to say mm. the Akkadian Empire is the first, among the first, if not the first empire. Yeah. Um, another sort of definition, quite a fairly low resolution one, but I feel it serves, is that if you're an over king of mm. many kings, mm-hmm. you're an emperor. Yeah, you can call that that. Um, again, that's fairly low resolution, but, uh, you know, there you go. And that is this, exactly what Sargon did. <clears throat> and this is why we can say that the, the you know, the Persian Shah and Shah, the king of kings, mm. Was an emperor really mm. in what we would in the sort of modern political lexicon, and that's fair. I think that's totally fair. Mm. So, where last time we were talking about the Sumerians, and we set up uh, Lugal Zagazi, mm. a Sumerian king. Mm. Well, he was a type of king of kings, some sort of yes. over king. Um, but he only ruled over Sumerian cities. As well, I that, it. well, that's right. Uh, well, he okay. So his story is bound up with with Sargon's. Mm. So to get into him a bit, historians, scholars do seem to think that the proclamations we've got of him, his sort of victory stele and mm. stuff, they do think that his are sort of fairly certainly exaggerated. Um, that it, at least maybe not out and out lies, not like complete propaganda, but exaggerated because his he he claims that he sort of conquered as far as the mediterranean and stuff remember we're talking yeah. about southern iraq yeah. southern mesopotamia so it's about a thousand miles so yeah massive <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah. Did he really do that? I don't think, I think that there's not really any archaeology that backs it up. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. No. Because archaeology, when it comes to warfare, is quite difficult, especially the further you go back. There, we, it's easy to show where there were walls there and where there were fires and mm. certain things in archaeology. You can say, yes, that's definitely it. Mm. But warfare is difficult unless you find sort of mass burials with like um, yeah. with uh, uh, large traumas all over the s skeletons. Yeah. Or if you find like a massive cache of arrowheads or something, if you don't find that, then it's difficult to say. One of the perennial problems that military historians have is actually identifying where the battlefield was, because often it's you, you're given a description in the primary sources, but the landscape has changed in the intervening thousands of years. Mm. And as you say, actually, there's very little evidence. Like one of the, uh, I watched a documentary about this a while ago, and apparently on one hilltop near Thermopylae, they found a collection of bronze arrows. And that, okay, great, that that gives us an indication that Leonidas, or not Leonidas, but the Spartans sort of last stand where they get arrowed to death by the Persians. Well, that might be real, you mm. know, because that, that's what the account says. And so if they find a bunch of arrowheads there, okay, great, that may well be true. Um, but that's a very unique case where we can actually Found, you know, point to the story, the location, and the evidence to back it up. Because normally it's just a few thousand guys on either side hacking each other up, and then the battlefield gets stripped. By because yeah, well, it's exactly. uh, one thing people have got to remember as well: uh, a battlefield in the ancient world, it was like it would be like coming across a sort of um, a, a field strewn with Lamborghinis, right? All of this armor, all of these shields, all of these swords, horses, chariots. These things cost the earth. These were the most expensive things in society you could buy because they were difficult to manufacture. And so if you got to loot a battlefield, you were going to walk away making a lot of money out of it. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, people would come across it like locusts. Yeah. Take anything of value. Yeah. So. And, and a lot of the time in the Middle Ages or the ancient world, men would have all their money on them. Yes. Right. Yeah. So you could, they might have they their could pockets ransom themselves filled yeah. with money, possibly yeah. potentially. Yeah. All the, and they'd definitely be wearing uh, rings and, you know, necklaces and you know, maybe gold teeth, things like this. Like it was, uh, there was a lot of money on a battlefield. But even if archaeologists do find on a sort of uh, an ancient Mesopotamian archaeological dig, they do find a load of arrowheads, hmm. say, it could just be hunting. Yep. It could just been somewhere where they were manufacturing them. It doesn't mean yep. that a battle happened there at absolutely. all. It's very difficult to say a battle happened here. And you're absolutely right that even a great example of what we're talking about here is Agincourt. Yeah. That's only 500 odd years ago. And the field of Agincourt, the archaeology doesn't really show a battle happened there. No. We assume that's the field because it's roughly in the location. It's got that upward incline. Mm. And so it look and it's muddy. And so it looks like it could be the field, but it could be one over there or one over there. Who knows? And that's, uh, that's a mere 500 years ago. Mm. This is 4,000 years older than that. Yeah. So uh, points in Sargon's career and life anyway. Mm. Um, so, for example, in Agincourt, it may just be that the accounts we've got are slightly wrong. I mean, it may be that the battlefield was absolutely stripped, but that seems unlikely. You would mm. have thought there'd be, especially as, as muddy as the account says it was, that there would be quite a few things buried in the mud and doesn't yeah. really seem to be much or really anything there. Mm. So it seems like somewhere along the way through the centuries. Yeah, you think there's some broken spurs or something would be the, the story metal got, detected. Right. You know, but it, yeah, it, it but nothing's be. come up really. Not really. So, so you, well, you would think at least mm. there would be some mass burials. Mm. Um, so again, somewhere along the way, the story, the location has been mm. sort of lost. Uh, so, for example, um, Sargon has his capital at various points along the way, but at some point he makes his capital Akkad. Mm. We don't know where that is. No, it's a lost city. <laughs> yeah, it's completely yeah. lost. Assuming it existed, which it seems it, it almost certainly must have done, um, it's just somewhere in modern-day Iraq, yeah. probably Presum central northern uh, Iraq, and yeah, no, we don't know it's not been found. To the north of Babylon, probably not far up, but we don't know much about it. Yeah. So to say that a whole city, which would have been the capital of an empire, and the empire lasts over 150 years, 180 odd years, this empire. Yeah, which is sort of, good innings for the very first empire. Yeah. The centre of the world, in a way. Yeah. Uh, there's accounts that um, Sargon brought loads of treasures and possessions of his enemies to Akkad. It would have had a ziggurat and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. We've got no idea where it is. So that gives people an idea. Um, just one last point to say on that. When it comes to history, 
so, uh, sometimes people think it's easy to think that we know a lot more than we really do. Mm. It's actually, and I'm not even talking far back, in the Middle Ages, we actually, mm. it's sort of a very fragmentary story we've got. So, for example, if you go back to the pre-Tudor ages, the pre-Tudor age, there's very few buildings left <clears throat> that are pre-Tudor. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a handful. Yeah. And you think, oh, well, but... Uh, I thought we sort of knew everything. Well, no, there's like a handful of Norman keeps. That's only a few hundred years ago. And there's a few, right. So when you go back in to a, in a, and what's more in a long settled and basically undisturbed country. Mm. And yet we, and, and in England, we've totally valued things that are ancient. We don't destroy them. We keep them because we think that they've accumulated worth sh purely through the age. And so if we don't have those things, you can imagine how difficult it is to find things from, Cultures that have been taken over by people who just don't care about the past. Yeah. Which has happened many times to Iraq. Oh, yeah. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> the amount of destruction and sort of deliberate trying to wipe out yeah. what came before uh, in Iraq is yeah. <laughs> mad, really. Um, Awful. It's surprising that there's sort of any archaeology <clears throat> left in mm -hmm. a way. Um, but, yeah, so when we – that's why literary evidence mm. is so unbelievably valuable – because if we'd lost, for example, in the story of Sargon, if we'd lost all the literary evidence, he'd almost certainly be lost entirely. We wouldn't even know his name. All right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of a translation as well, Sargon. What he called himself was a different word. and uh, it Sharu just, Kinu. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Which, which means legitimate king, which clearly is some a throne name he's taken himself. Just say, what do we call you? Oh, just call me legitimate king. Uh what do you mean? Well, that's my name. So, yeah, but what's your real name? Don't know. <laughs> Just legitimate king. Yeah. That's what my mum called me, I guess. That'll do. It. I'll take it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Also, there's a little bit there. Maybe it's on chess. I can't sure it is a bit, but I've seen a fair few people say that that speaks of if you really were a legitimate king, you, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't need. That. Yeah, right. But we, we know he's not the legitimate king. Right. That's the thing, you know. Uh, he He's the first meritocrat, maybe. Well, so let's get into his story. Yeah, so okay, yeah. he isn't royal born. He isn't born no. to the purple or anything, is he? No, he's, he's, if, a, he's if you a, believe his origin story. He's a total orphan. Yeah. He's just some random orphan. And so what, one thing I like about the Sargon legend is that he predates the, the mythos of Moses by at least a thousand years, but has basically the same origin story. Um, his mum was a priestess, I believe it was, uh, Obviously, wasn't supposed to have him, and so she puts him in a basket, seals him, seals it with bitumen, and s floats him down the Euphrates. And at a, I think it's Kish, the the royal gardener of Kish called Aki, uh, is just at the river one day, and this basket with a baby turns up, and he's like, "Oh, well, okay, I'll raise this baby, and I'll take care of this baby because that's the right thing to do." And so Sargon is raised as a gardener. Um, as the as the son of the royal gardener, and we don't really know what happens in Kish, but there is something that happens when Sargon's about eighteen, and then there's a break in the text, and suddenly he's the king, <laughs> and we don't know what happened there. Um, but that's a really really fascinating story because the social layering of the palace and the civilization itself would have been the king a selection of very close nobles a much larger noble class then the servants of which the gardener would have been one and then the free peasants working the land right so sargon wasn't someone who had familial connections he wasn't someone who was entitled he wasn't he wasn't a lineal descent uh, you know descendant of the king he wasn't a member of a powerful noble family that could gather together the manpower to overthrow the king and we don't really know what happened apart from apparently Ishtar appears to him. He's, he's what's re it's really cute actually in the, um, in the description, because you can tell the feeling of time that they have because Sargon is tasked by, uh, one of the, I think it's the, the blacksmith or something to take a letter to someone else. And in the, in the text, it says this is in the time before envelopes were invented, <laughs> uh, but Sargon can't read. Um, so uh, I think it's Ishtar interrupts him and says, right, you can't go into the temple because you're polluted with blood, which is, a, who knows what that means. Right. Mm -hmm. um, um, but he ends up getting into some sort of uh, intercession with the deities. And then there's a break in the text and suddenly he's the king. So, 
it seems that what it is is the gods have decided that Sargon should be the king for some reason, which is obviously some post hoc rationalization of he overthrew something, mm. right? Because mm. the oh, and uh, the is Lugal Zagzi who That's right. That's was, who goes yeah, to yeah. the message, is yeah, Zagzi. and he's ill as well. He's he's urinating himself, he's um, vomiting, and so he's incontinent, and so he's clearly sick and dying, and so. I presume he doesn't have a an heir or something like that. I think maybe there's a there's well there's a bit more to the story. Sorry, I, I think maybe, I'm just going off my memory. Uh, yeah, yeah um, mixed up a couple of different characters okay, go, there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, well, just to go back quickly because you mentioned like five or six yeah, great yeah. things there already. That like yeah. took for twenty minutes about. It's, piece, it's been but, ages since um, I've read it. Um, so just to mention the his origin story and the the parallels with Moses. Mm. It's not just Moses, is it? There's lots of oh, stories. No, there's, loads. Yeah. there's one from Egyptian mythology or even mm. Romulus. And Remus have floated down a river yeah, and picked up yeah. by someone. But the, um, mo- the most obvious one being Moses, because yeah. of course of the Babylonian exile, which is clearly where the Israelites picked up the story. So one thing to say right there: a lot of the Sargon story, um, not all of it. There are you know original cu- cuneiform um, bits, fragments, but a lot of it is from the later Babylonian yeah. uh, civilization, where they hark back and talk about him. So there's a bit th- uh, where that survives from the Babylonian times. So hundreds and hundreds of years later, yeah. maybe a thousand years later. Um, but, and they put words in the mouth of Sargon, which obviously is another Everyone ancient um, technique, which, you know, modern historians say, he obviously probably didn't say these exact words. But anyway, we have him saying of himself, my mother was a high priestess. My father, I knew not. Uh, the brothers of my father loved the hills. My city is Azupiranu. Which no is situ- is. Yeah, 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 which is situated on the banks of the Euphrates. My high priestess mother. Sometimes I've seen it. The translation called a changeling, mm. um, but that's a convoluted way of saying a priestess, I suppose. My high priestess mother conceived me in secret. Well, no, I think uh, changeling would mean uh, foreigner or um, infiltrator or something like that. Yeah, like I say, it's a very convoluted way of... Yeah. It's not clear. That's no. right. That's not yeah. clear. And that's another thing you said just then when you were talking. Yeah. Um, there's loads of uh, Ambigu- lines in ambiguities. this that are just completely ambiguous. Yeah. It's like, yeah. well, what do you even mean by that? Well, the, just uh, sorry to interrupt the flow here. Okay. We'll, we'll start this again because this is another thing that we've got to load this with. Because you were saying, like, uh, we've lost things over the last 500 years. And it's like, the 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 meaning of language itself and the way we describe the world has changed so radically since the days of Sargon. It's amazing we can draw anything from this. Mm. I mean, I, I watched a, a video the other day that was like, by the way, the ancient Egyptian, Egyptians didn't have a word for blue. They called the Mediterranean the Great Green. The word for blue is only a few hundred years old. The concept of blue as a color. Wow, really? Yeah, apparently. I mean, I have. I didn't go through the original sources, so they might be wrong or whatever. But like, if if that's the case, I mean, it it shows you just how radically different the modern worldview is to the ancient worldview, right? And we have different concepts to describe, presumably, what are the same things. So again, like, it's the 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 time, just the weight of time. You can feel it when you're reading through these things. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing to say about individual words is obviously the an English translation, obviously. Um, from cuneiform, so it's almost entirely up to the scholar who yeah. translated it to pick the words yeah. that I'm now reading. And this has been uh, through about three or four languages to get to us. And whatever least. he picks, right, yeah. So yeah. it'll probably be a Babylonian yeah. transcribing uh, an actual Akkadian yeah. uh, tablet. Yes. And then... And then, and, and presumably into Greek or something, because maybe. there's going to be some sort of Rosetta Stone of Babylonian and Greek or Egyptian to Greek and whatever. And the, it, so it's a long chain of uh, descriptions. And then some 19th century or yeah. early 20th century English scholar translating it. And the words he pick, yeah. he picks, are now what I'm reading. Yes. So it's like what the original, the original, original thing was or meant. Yeah. I mean, we gonna- can't be confident that. There are going to be certain it? things we can be fairly confident on. The words like father, probably fairly universal in the human experience. The Euphrates, probably re- relatively accurate. Um, the city Azu Piranu, probably, but we don't know anything about it. Because it's a proper it. name. Yeah, because so it's a proper name. It's only really be one thing. Exactly. But the, the emotional words that carry implication and intonation and uh, describe more than one thing in more than one way 
uh, they're going to be uh, totally suspect. And mm. it's not the translator's fault either. Mm. Mm. There's nothing they could have right. done. Yeah. Like, they've what, got what, to, they, yeah. If they're going to translate, they've got to say something. Yeah. So And and like we like the, the concept of gardener, we assume, means gardener in the way that we think of it. It might mean some sacred office or something <laughs> right. like that, of someone who is ordering a replica of the universe so that the king can find tranquility and alignment with the stars or something. We don't, we don't know, you know, knows, right. we, we, and so, and it's honestly, that's not an unrealistic uh, assessment that I've just given either, even though I just pulled it off the top of my head. It might actually be that that's how they envisage these things. Because remember having a garden four and a half thousand years ago was a remarkable feat in the middle of the desert. So, you know, this is genuinely like a heavenly thing. Mm. So, I mean, I, like I said, I've just made that up, but actually that might be more accurate to just the way that you as a, like, you know, an Englishman looking at your little back garden is thinking about it, you know? Yeah. In our world, a gardener is, is not, not, very a, it's not a big deal. No, no. It's what retired people do. Yes. Little old ladies spend yeah. time tending their garden. Yeah. Whereas in those days, a gardener might be a really important position in society, you know, like, or later, yeah. a bit later, the, the term a cupbearer comes up. Yeah. We would think perhaps in sort of high medieval times, a cupbearer is something a 16 year old kid does wow. or someone, it's not that important, but it's obviously really important in their world to be a cup bearer but it was whatever also, that means it, it was important in the middle ages actually it, well, you would direct... be a very low rung on something but, but you were uh, you were in direct contact with the king every okay, day right that's not know? to be sniffed at, absolutely absolutely right not you know yeah. you got to hear the the privileged conversations to watch the full video please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com